So, in preparing for this keynote, we went through a lot of heady topics. We talked about the meaning of meaning, we talked about fractal reflections of ego, we talked about the nature of human virtue. But it soon became apparent to us in preparing for this keynote that a lot of this was more suitable for an essay than a 15 minute talk. So I'm going to focus my talk today on relatively lightweight questions, attempting to answer things such as, what is the meaning of life? And as it turns out, meaning has a lot to do with the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and the pursuit of virtue in general. As Plato said, those who tell the stories rule society. If society is a story, then with the power of a fiat money printer, that story is largely authored by a powerful minority of central planners. Many of us here are here because we dream of a new and better story, one authored by sovereign individuals and for the benefit of humanity, where individuals author their own destiny instead of having their roles written by central planners and a state that is antagonistic to their wants, desires, and dreams. There are two major experiences in my life that have been very transformative. One was my discovery of Bitcoin. The other was becoming a father to my beautiful daughter, Penny. And if society is a story, through Bitcoin, I discovered how ugly the current storyline is. And by being a father to my beautiful daughter, I discovered how excellent it could and should be. As individuals, Bitcoin showed me that we're each a node on the network with a unique yet equal responsibility to be the change we wish to see in the world. My daughter taught me that responsibility is not an intellectual abstraction, but a set of specific actions that must be fulfilled each and every day. These thoughts are a powerful reminder that I'm shaping a story that my daughter Penny will one day inherit and that I have a responsibility, even if just a small part, to make a positive difference in this world. And when I look on the world today, I see a fiat fairy tale that's quickly devolving into a nightmare. Instead of kids living this, they get this. Instead of this, they get this. And instead of this, they get this. It's a story of division and fragmentation, not just between people, but within people. And as an aspiring sovereign individual, I'm not here to play any blame games, but I think we can all identify the source of this cultural fragmentation. Fractured money leads to fractured hearts, leads to fractured minds, leads to fractured societies. The new story we write under a Bitcoin standard should be where kids feel valuable and valued instead of lost, broken, and isolated. But where can we start? One important place to look is the condition that describes the optimal human experience known as the flow state. Flow was popularized by psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi but it's a phenomenon that has been studied by great philosophers like William James and Nietzsche. Flow describes the optimal state of consciousness where our skills are pushed to their limits, where we feel and perform our best, where we lose track of time and self-identity. Meditators call it nirvana, athletes call it the zone, and performers simply call it peak performance. We experience flow when we focus deeply on a difficult task which is properly mapped to our present skill level. Flow occurs when our actions, when our awareness rather, is totally absorbed by our actions. Another deep thinker on flow states is Stephen Kotler who says, flow is more than an optimal state of consciousness, one where we feel and perform our best, it is also it also appears to be the only practical answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? Flow is what makes life worth living. Cutler outlines the key properties of flow experience, and as, sovereign, as a sovereign individual, as a father, and as a freedom maximalist, these properties offer very interesting insights. 
These are the five progressive properties of flow. First is curiosity. A curious mind desires to learn more, and this can lead to the discovery of passion, a powerful emotional drive that transforms curiosity into a purpose. Purpose is an intentional aim or calling which encourages an individual to pursue autonomy. Autonomy is a state of self-determination and independence that forges self-mastery, which is the possession of valuable skills, virtue, and the status of self-authorship. Looking at this list, three things jump out to me. First is that all these properties practically define what it means to be a sovereign individual. Self-mastery is a synonym for self-sovereignty. To be the master of one's own body, one's own mind, one's own emotions, one's own actions, one's own property. Secondly, each of these properties are characteristics that any loving parent would want their child to experience and possess. From natural curiosity to hard-earned self-mastery. It is also, and not by coincidence, the exact qualities that central planners do not want in their populations. Curious people don't trust the experts, and self-mastered people won't tolerate a big brother which violates their privacy or their property. Third, and of deep significance to the very basis of capitalism itself, every good and every service that has ever existed and succeeded on the market, or will ever exist for that matter, is generated by this process. This process is the process of creation itself. Flow states, both in experience and in the results, are the foundation of everything we hold dear as sovereign individuals, as parents, and as freedom maximalists. The story of sovereign individuality could be described as the pursuit of flow. The sovereign individual is a curious, passionate, purpose-driven, autonomous individual mastering himself through acts of creation. And in this way, flow and Bitcoin are a match made in heaven. If flow produces self-mastery, which is the perfect means for creating value in the world, Bitcoin is what secures our property, which is the perfect means for preserving value. So we must ask ourselves, if flow is such a profound state for individuals, why is it an exception rather than the rule? It is noteworthy that children have no problem entering flow. They do it naturally when they're allowed to play freely. It is only as we condition children through education that they lose that talent. The state institutions we entrust to nurture our children's curiosities and passions seemingly do the opposite. This is, of course, by design. This is the argument made by John Taylor Gatto, an American educator in his books, Weapons of Mass Instruction, and Dumbing Us Down, The Hidden Curriculum of Compulsory Schooling. Titles that in themselves tell a grim story about the Western educational system. Gatto describes how Western schooling was inspired by 19th century Prussia. After its defeat in the Napoleonic Wars, Prussia engineered an educational system that produced obedient citizens and a disciplined workforce. Western reformers simply imported this model as their own for the purpose of churning out uniform workers. Perhaps this had some benefits during the Industrial Age, but it's serving less and less purpose as we progress deeper into the Digital Age. But one thing is for sure, and it's not a conspiracy, the system was never intended to nurture curious, passionate kids, but it's explicitly to manufacture obedient workers. In our new digital paradigm, humanity doesn't need obedient workers. We need imaginative young minds that can create the future, rather than mindlessly repeating patterns of the past. The only way humanity can grow is to keep moving forward, embracing new technologies, and living under conditions of freedom. And as Gatto puts this, Growth and mastery come only to those who vigorously self-direct, initiating, creating, doing, reflecting, freely associating, enjoying privacy. These are precisely what the structure of schooling are set up to prevent on one pretext or another. In the story of fiat public schooling, curiosity is killed as early as possible. 
Playtime is replaced with rote memorization. Self-understanding is replaced with critical race theory. The story which, has been which was written for us may not have had nefarious intentions originally, but it certainly seems to now. And as Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. And under a fiat standard, that stage is controlled by central planners, and individuals are mere players in their centrally planned drama. Under these conditions, we are prone to behavior rather than action. In other words, when we give the state the authority to author our lives, each time we fail to self-author our own. This distinction between action and behavior is understood by economists as the difference between behavior as reflexive, conditioned reflexive behaviors, and action as purposeful action. And it is these reflexive behaviors that we become lost in meaninglessness. Vices like addiction, endless social media scrolling, the repeating of unconscious programs, substance abuse, etc. all these cheap sources of dopamine are addictive and reflexive. These patterns are easily ingrained when a sense of higher purpose is lacking, which makes individuals susceptible to behavioral conditioning by the state. Larry Fink of BlackRock recently said, behaviors are going to have to change. You have to force behaviors. At BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. Without individual purpose and passion, people turn to virtue signaling instead where their own individual action is assume, subsumed by state-sponsored activism, LGBTQ+, BLM, climate change activism, et cetera, all encouraged by the same central planners that issue ESG mandates. If forcing behaviors, as Fink says, I'm sorry, enforcing behaviors, as Fink says, the natural human instinct to find flow is obstructed. Curiosity is turned into conformity, Passion is turned into addiction. Purposeful individual action substituted for state-sponsored activism. Autonomy is eradicated, and captivity is conditioned. And self-mastery is punished, while mediocrity is rewarded. Excellence, a virtuous ideal always worth striving for, is reclassified as discriminatory and replaced with participation trophies and body positivity. By hindering the human capacity to face challenges courageously and thus develop competence, we undermine the human capacity for virtue. As Chick Sent Me Hai puts it, of all the virtues we can learn, no trait is more useful, more essential for survival, and more likely to improve the quality of life than the ability to transform adversity into an enjoyable challenge. Seen in this light, the greatest act of rebellion against the state that feeds on a fractured society is to make flow and its properties sacred ideals in our lives. As sovereign individuals, we want to make it a moral duty to reject participation in the state's fractious narrative and embrace virtues that flow allows us to cultivate. Instead of fighting the state's story, we can each be the peaceful revolution we wish to see in the world. We can write something new, but to do that, we have to fervently protect and passionately encourage our most curious minds, those who are the most vulnerable and most precious to us, our kids. I once read that the moral test of a society is how it treats its children. Does this look like a healthy society to you? I ask myself, what kind of ideal must I strive for in order to protect a world in which Penny's curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and self-mastery are hers and her alone? What is required of me individually? Even in this question, Bitcoin as the antithesis to fiat statism offers us great inspiration. Imagine if the ideologies of Bitcoin and fiat were to take human form. As cyborgs engineered for the task of protecting everything you cared most about in the world, your son, your daughter, your family, 
First, imagine a cyborg coded in the spirit of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, endowing itself with unquestionable authority and left to protect your loved ones. It would lie every day. It would make promises it doesn't intend to keep. It would waste energy and resources for purposes of violence. If it ran out of resources, it would borrow them from the savings you set aside for your kids without your permission. It would coerce, deceive, and manipulate without remorse. It would be abusive and demanding. It would gamble away your kids' savings and then steal everything your loved ones owned. If things got tough, it would even instigate a war and conscript your children to die for its debts. Grim stuff. Now let's instead imagine a cyborg with the values and virtue of Bitcoin. It would have a singular goal, to offer perfect security to you and your loved ones. It would never lie, it would be radically honest, because Bitcoin is truth. It would never stop working, no watt would be expended wastefully. It would have its door open to protect not just your family, but everyone else in the neighborhood. It could never be coerced or deceived, and it would always verify rather than trust. It would save energy to support your kids and store it safely into the future forever. It would adapt itself to any and all conditions to fulfill its singular purpose. And it would exhibit perfect integrity in that it would only ever do exactly what it says it will do. A truly humbling standard such a cyborg would set as a guardian. In a truly positive world, it would provide for a child to grow and develop. A world of love, safety, and trust. A world where their excellence is encouraged from curiosity to passion to purpose to autonomy all the way to self-mastery. As first-generation Bitcoiners, it is up to us to be this change we wish to see in the world. And we should embrace this challenge as the defining struggle of our lives. As Thomas Paine wrote, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day so that my child may have peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Moss, for that quote, by the way. As a father, I want to be able to protect my daughter from the malevolence in the world, but as a mortal, I know that one day this will be impossible. I have deep gratitude to the symbol of Satoshi as an immortal guardian for my daughter, and one that will persist long after I'm gone. And it is this pursuit of flow, virtue, and excellence where I pray we can all find meaning in life. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor of Bitcoin Magazine. We're here again at the Bitcoin Magazine live desk broadcasting from Bitcoin 2023. Joined by our special guest now, Amanda Cavalieri, chair of the Bitcoin Today Coalition, Marty Bent, host of the TFTC podcast, and Jordan Schachtel, independent investigative journalist. We just heard from Robert Breedlove, host of the What is Money podcast. His message, the economic system is failing. We must try to find it within ourselves to fix it. Amanda, throwing over to you, what is the future we see with Bitcoin uh, what is, how are you waking people up to this problem? I think people are waking up on their own. I mean, we learn, we change through either pain or pleasure. Most of us are so brainwashed to only change through pain that that's, and we're about to get a lot more pain. I think we're going to see more banks collapsing, more governments trying to get more control, and that's just going to hurt people on a larger and larger scale. So as we as individuals feel the pain and have to reconcile with that, Ideally, they can get onboarded to Bitcoin at that time and see the value in this and why it's actually important. The failure of the system driving people to Bitcoin. Marty, your take? Yeah, I think it's definitely happening. People are wondering why our price is going up, why are the quality of my service is going down, and they're intuitively feeling that pain and then going to go seek a yeah. solution. And Bitcoin is that solution, and so it's just. But things are getting worse, right? Inflation, a 40-year high. We've seen economic activities have been in the red. A recession coming this year, but yet we're not really seeing the price of Bitcoin go up. Jordan, I'm just wondering your take. Yeah, you know, the ama one of the amazing things about Bitcoin is that it's it's a true custody solution for what we're seeing with what 
Amanda just talked about with all these banks failing. I mean, if you're over the FDIC limit, the government basically just told you that if you're in the wrong bank, you could be in big trouble. You know, with Bitcoin, there's custodial, you can take custody of your own asset, which is, which is an amazing technological revolution. And I think that it's, it's basically only a matter of time before many more people realize that in the Bitcoin conference, is a great pe place to educate people on this solution to the problems that we're currently facing. Largest banks also in trouble, Silicon Valley Bank. We've seen these collapses. Amanda, how is this playing in Washington? Are they waking up to the fact that their system has faults? Most definitely. I mean, we've, um, with the Bitcoin Today Coalition, have been meeting with uh, ag, finance, all of these different committees. And especially right now, it's interesting to see um, Democrats and Republicans being equally concerned with Gary Gensler's stance on on all of this, on digital assets, and not being able to say, you know, what's a commodity and what's a security. It's very obvious that Bitcoin's a commodity. He said that several times, but the inability for him to move to what's next, what's a security, they're going to leapfrog that into what are stable coins. It's like, well, who does that benefit at the end of the day? So it's like looking at just how broken the incentive structure is, and the best thing that we can do and that we're trying to do is slow the train down a little bit so more people can get onboarded in the meantime. We have banks failing, we have people adopting. Vic, uh, Marty, your take? Yeah, I mean, the, the future is now, if you're an individual who is uh, dissatisfied with the system, you don't like what the government does, whether it's lock you down in your house, whether it's print too much money, you have the ability to take action and to opt in to Bitcoin, whether you want to acquire Bitcoin uh, and hold it as an asset, or if you want to contribute to building out tools on the Bitcoin network, it is open source mm. technology, and this power is needs to be realized by more people. You do not have to wait for politicians mm. to change the system. You can do it today. It's open source software. You can download a wallet, receive Bitcoin, send Bitcoin. Mm. You can change the world. You don't need to mm. go ask politicians to do it, and that is extremely powerful. Jordan, your take, how does Bitcoin fit into this current banking crisis, this crisis of confidence in the dollar right now? Yeah, Bitcoin's just better money. I mean, if you want your money to be controlled by Joe Biden and uh, Janet Yellen and, and, the, and the Congress, the, those terrific moral people, then by all means continue to uh, you know, stuff the, that cash under your mattress. But we have a terrific solution that was discovered in 2008 and uh, you know, continues to showcase its applications through its you know, continuing... Um, a market cap, uh, you know, we're now at hundreds of billions of dollars in fiat value, and I think it's only going to continue to increase as people see the incredible value proposition. And of course, the dollar only declining uh, since its introduction. We're going back to the main stage, thermodynamic savings. You'll be hearing from Bill Miller the fourth and Michael Saylor in a fireside. Smash that like button, hit the subscribe, and stay with us here on Bitcoin Magazine Live. We'll be right back. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.